not fully wrong when he says that because the cost of desalination has dropped so much, I think you can basically turn any part of the world green. It just begs the question of where does the energy come from? And hence, Elon's vision is pretty simple. Build large solar power farms next to even larger desalination plants and send a gazillion liters of new water into the system until the world is lush green everywhere. End of the story. Boom profit. Now the problem is that Elon isn't really a water specialist. His vision is basically the water equivalent of turning to faster horses with all the drawbacks it implies and he might be missing the step change ahead. But before we cover that, why does it matter? Well, you may know that 4 billion people experience severe water scarcity for at least one month per year today. By the end of the decade, water scarcity might displace over 700 million people and by 2050, three out of four people worldwide could face drought impact. I can go on for a while explaining how droughts cost exceed $300 billion today or how water scarcity could reduce GDP by up to 12% in parts of India and China by 2050, but I believe you get the point, we're missing water and there's a certain irony in that happening on the blue planet, something else Elon is right about. Earth is 70% water by surface area. So there's a certain appeal and elegance to taking some more of that blue and turning it into perfect drinking water through desalination and if desalination can't solve everything and should probably not even be the first solution to turn to but it's a different story, there's no denying that it will be a part of the answer. Now, desalination in itself is not new. At the end of the 19th century, Malta and Russia were already desalinating water, while for the major part of the 20th century it has been growing in importance all over the world. But at the time, desalination was done quite differently from today. It was a thermal process where you evaporate salt water, then condensate the steam, and voila, you've got fresh water, which is exactly what's happening in the natural water cycle when it rains. And honestly, if energy was free and limitless, we would probably still be doing it that way, except it's neither free nor limitless. And when the 70s came around with their successive oil shocks, we started noticing. So people started looking for alternatives. John Kennedy famously said that desalination is a work that in many ways is more important than any other scientific enterprise and the rest is history. Reverse osmosis got developed and within 20 years it had taken over the desalination market. The reasons are simple and logic. Compared to thermal desalination, reverse osmosis uses about 10 times less energy but also significantly less space. It's easier to operate and it hence can desalinate more water faster and cheaper. Even more so with the commoditization of the used membrane technology as it became mass market, which made it even cheaper and more efficient. What's not to love? Well, the thing is, there's no free lunch. Arrow is better than thermal, but it's not perfect. It still takes quite some space on shore, and coastal cities tend to not have that much space on their waterfront. Arrow membranes foul, scale, break like any industrial process. You're moving quite a lot of water from the ocean to the shore, and you might suck in fishes and larvae. And the other way around, when you're discharging your brine back to the ocean, it may be harmful to marine ecosystems and wildlife. So, to work with these drawbacks, we more and more resolved to giant desalination projects. As with scale, it became became doable to locate those plants outside of the cities, build new water networks to convey the water in town, but also giant undersea infrastructure to collect water a bit further from shore where it's cleaner, sometimes even under the ocean's floor, and even more importantly bring back the brine reject some kilometers into the ocean where the less shallow water helped to dissipate the increased salinity faster and with less impact. That solves some of the nation's challenges, but it also creates a double drawback. First, it makes us rely again on the large-scale infrastructure which we have to design for peak demand and hence is oversized most of the time and is pretty expensive in energy to operate as water is bulky and heavy and pumping it around accounts for about 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Large-scale centralized infrastructure was a necessary evil when we first built it during the 19th century but today, in the era of digitization and automation, it's quite a setback to be trapped in that central tangle again. Second drawback, the larger this project becomes, the more more financially risky they get. A typical large-scale desalination project costs over a billion dollars, and you can go and ask your municipal water utility if they have that money. Surprisingly, they don't. So building desalination plants is a typical private-public partnership where a private developer will design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the plant over 20 or 30 years before turning it back to the municipality. This, in turn, is a risky move for the private developer. I told you last year the story of the Melbourne desalination plant, which 
basically stranded Suez for years with construction costs that went $1.1 billion over the initial $2.9 billion estimates and operational revenue that was heavily impacted by the fact that the plant was not used at all in the first six years of its useful life. This is not an isolated case in history as I could tell you the story of the Santa Barbara desalination plant that got built in 1991, commissioned and operated for four months in 1992 and then put on standby for 23 years before it got reactivated in 2015. But that's not even the main risk. What if you spend time and money to develop a project that never happened? Well, that's what happened to Poseidon in California as they spent 15 years to plan, develop and lobby for a proposed desalination plant in Huntington Beach that ultimately got rejected when the California Coastal Commission denied their permit in 2022. It might have been for good reasons, it probably was, I don't know honestly, but it just highlights that in the cost of development of a very large scale desalination project, you have quite a lot of preparation work, permitting and studies to do. Steve Close from Burton and Ventures estimated that share of preparation work to 45% of a project's cost. That's quite a gamble, especially if you're not sure about the outcome. Maybe as a consequence, there's a growing reluctance from the large water companies to build desalination plants. Don't get me wrong, they're very happy to design them, procure them, operate them, maintain them and even finance them. But but the letter in the EPC acronym that they're reluctant to carry is the C that stands for construction. Veolia, who's both the largest water company in the world and the largest desalination plant supplier as we speak, opted out of the construction business some years ago as their executives reminded us at their latest deep dive. We exited the construction business. We have derised this activity five to six years ago with the discontinuation of the construction business. And recent events would tend to nudge other of the top players to follow suit, the third largest desalination plant supplier, Vabag, experienced a painful setback end of last year when the Saudi Water Authority cancelled a large desalination project they had won, causing their stock price to take a 20% hit. But even more spectacular, 2024's number 4 also topped 2023's ranking, Metito, just underwent a strong strategic reshuffle, notably involving splitting in three to reduce its exposure to construction risks. Despite winning prestigious contracts like the mega desalination plant in Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Metito is deliberately shifting away from from construction heavy EPC work. And this exactly because, to quote their CEO, while project awards are based 80% on process design and only 20% on construction management, the actual risks are flipped. 80% of the risk lies in the construction and just 20% in the process. So for Metito specifically, their EPC division, Meti Pro, will now undergo what they call a period of rationalization, distancing from construction and focusing instead on engineering and procurement, where they see more value add. Now I hear you, Assuming you're not a shareholder, why should you care that large private companies with plenty of money face risky endeavors when building more desalination projects? Well, the answer is simple. These companies still need to make a living, so they need to offset their risk. And the straightforward way to do that is to increase the water tariff. So you see, we're in a bit of a tsukspang. To cope with the physical limitations of desalination as we know it, we're resolving to always larger projects. But those larger projects lead to even larger risk, which in turn become problems themselves. But after all, if we have no other choice, we'll have to resolve to those faster horses, right? Well, that's where actually it's not black or white. We have more options. And before looking into three of them, let me preface that by saying that, yes, I said step change because yes, somewhat it is an evolution of the paradigm, but the options I'm putting on the table today will not replace desalination as we know it. They will enhance it and offer better alternatives in some places and certainly complementary options in others. So let's start by looking at my first alternative, subsea desalination. Subsea desalination promises to cut energy consumption in half, reduce pretreatment infrastructure by 60%, and divide the space needed on shore by 20, all while minimizing brine's impact and bringing chemical discharge to zero. I know, at this stage, it sounds too good to be true, so let me explain. With this approach, the actual desalination doesn't happen on shore, but at a depth of 400 meters on the bottom of the ocean, which has two major advantages. Number one, the water quality down there is much better and consistent over time 
time, then closer to the shore or in shallower waters, as less light reaches down there, preventing photosynthesis. If you combine that with reduced oxygen levels, it results in fewer bacteria, algae, and particles, which in turn means less pretreatment needs for your desalination process. The second advantage is that at 400 meters depth, you are physically under 400 meters of water, and as every 10 meters represents one bar of pressure, you hence receive 40 bars of pressure for free, which you can directly apply on the reverse osmosis module. Beyond those two physical advantages, you also have a welcome side effect. As you're desalinating water exactly where water is, and hence don't have to move it around, you can afford to be pretty inefficient with your desalination ratio, which also means that you're very, very mildly concentrating your brine, resulting in an almost neglectable salinity increase around your operation. Now, don't take me wrong. Water still doesn't come for free. You have to pump the fresh water back from the bottom of the ocean to the shore, which will take approximately 2 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. On the plus side of the equation, the dramatically reduced space needed on shore allows to deploy the solution basically anywhere, enabling the benefits of decentralized or distributed solutions and offering a good answer to places where space is limited or expensive, so not only California and any large coastal city, but also simply any island in the world. On the flip side of the coin, though, installing and maintaining equipment at a 400 meters depth takes a specific skill set, and if permitting has been pretty straightforward so far for companies deploying small-scale systems or pilots, it may evolve in the future if we start aiming for larger scale and larger impact. Now, if that solution is of interest to you, I've explored it in depth, pun intended, with Alexander Fugelsang, the CEO and founder of Flotion, a subsea desalination company on the podcast. The link is in the description. The second alternative, wave-powered desalination. Okay, so I'll assume you like the fact that subsea desalination uses 40 to 50 percent less energy than conventional desalination, right? So what if now you could simply reduce that energy consumption again and drive it all the way down to zero? You heard that right, wave-powered desalination requires zero external energy to run. All it needs to produce perfect drinking water is a regular supply of 1.5 meter high waves. To make productive use of those, you anchor a buoy in a 15 to 30 meter deep water, and the wave making it move up and down will action a pump that drives seawater through all the typical steps of a desalination process, a pretreatment filter first, then a reverse osmosis, and while slightly concentrated brines get rejected under the buoy, pressurized fresh water gets pushed through an undersea pipe all the way to the shore. The plus side is straightforward. Once installed, your system basically runs for free, and certainly carbon-free, while scaling production up and down is as simple as adding or removing a buoy, it hardly gets more modular than that, right? Visually speaking, and in terms of space requirements, it's no different to a boat that would rest on an anchor, and it will keep producing day and night as long as waves keep going. Last but not least, compared to subsea, it's much easier to deploy as diving 30 meters deep is not the same challenge as 300 meters deep. Now, on the flip side, you're also using the exact same treatment train than the one you're using in conventional onshore plants, so it scales, it fouls, and it breaks, especially in the harsh marine environment, which means that maintenance is up two notches, bonus points if you face adverse weather. And a bit like in an offshore wind farm that takes some sea surface real estate, it prevents fishing or general passing of ships. All in all, it sure makes for a promising, even more decentralized and distributed alternative to conventional desalination, which will make it a go-to in remote places, smaller communities, and again, islands. A third alternative, reverse electrodialysis. I'll tell you in a minute why I picked those three, so let me just mention now that there are more promising unconventional desalination technologies, all the way from microbial desalination cells to carrier gas extraction, freeze-thaw methods, and even four-stage water rejection. So if you'd like me to explore those, just let me know in the comments, and I'll consider covering them and more in a future release. But back to reverse electrodialysis, here we're promising at the same time reduced energy consumption, with 30% less energy required to desalinate water, all while entirely cutting the production of brines and building up the potential to mine seawater from minerals such as magnesium. I don't want to lose everybody here, so let me try to keep it simple. When you interface salt water with less salty water, you build what's called a salinity gradient power. A typical place where that occurs is in estuaries, where fresh water from a river mixes with the salt water of the sea. Harnessing that gradient in the words estuaries would generate an estimated 30 terawatts of energy to give you a sense of scale, and applied to desalination, it's a way to reduce salinity in a stream while producing energy. And if reverse electrodialysis or red will have a hard time to desalinate water all alone, as the less salt that's left, the more inefficient it gets, it makes for a powerful pretreatment that mildly reduces the salinity while producing energy.
energy that will contribute to powering the subsequent reverse osmosis step. At the other end of the process, you can take your brine through a second red step so that you bring it back to a typical seawater salinity while again producing energy. Now, as promising as that entire process looks like on paper, its technology readiness level for large-scale deployment is still in early stages with specific challenges around the ion exchanging membranes. So why did I pick it along subsea and wave power desalination today? Well, don't ask me, but ask water's growth stage investors. Indeed, last year, between the end of November and the beginning of December, it seemed like various VCs gave each other a call and decided it was the two weeks of alternative desalination. Medicine Energy, a reverse electrodialysis for desalination company, raised an $8.75 million seed round, while Flotion, the subsidy desalination play I mentioned earlier, raised a $9 million Series A, Oceanwell, another subsidy desalination company, raised an $11 million Series A, and Oneka Technologies raised a $4.25 million extension to its Series A to keep developing its wave power desalination technology. So, it's almost like venture capitalists knew something about the water markets that we don't. And as I wanted to make sure I did not miss any of their hidden wisdom, I dived deep into all of last year's and the six years before moves in Watertech's growth stage to extract seven must-know you'll find right here. For today, it seems to me like there's a word in which Elon Musk's vision of a lush, green earth powered at least partially by desalination has its appeal, assuming we don't just go for faster horses, but for a mix of clever approaches. So what do you think? Should we keep betting on large-scale solutions, or is it time to think smaller, smarter, and more sustainable? Let's discuss it in the comments, make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.